Very good. Thank you very much, Bronwyn and the Buddhist Library for inviting me to give this series of talks on doom and gloom. So last week we talked about the Lokadamas and we were looking at the eight, uh, eight Lokadamas and the difference between the view of an ordinary person and an enlightened being and how those beings can handle the worldly winds of things like gains and loss, praise and blame, reputation and ill repute and suffering and pleasure. And so that idea of a, a larger perspective is something that we're going to be exploring today in this topic, which is how to survive the end of the world. And this, of course, is uh, a big topic uh, can you survive the end of the world? Who knows? Maybe. Or how do you survive the end of the world? Or maybe is not surviving the best way to go for the end of the world? So uh, here we are at the monastery at the end of the world. And we're on Baramadigal land of the Darug people. And this is Aboriginal land, always was and always will be. And I pay my respects to... Uh, elders past, present and emerging. And I also extend that respect to any First Nations people who are here tonight and First Nations people everywhere. Thinking about this topic, the end of the world, thinking about how our worlds can end so easily and thinking especially of First Nations people and the terrible suffering of colonialism and the loss of, I guess, the whole world in many ways um, of those people all around the world. So um, we better press on. The end of the world is not going to wait for anyone. So I'm gonna do some screen sharing here and um, just kind of a, a warning that we're gonna be dealing with these issues of death and those sorts of things. Um, and, but I, always try to have a little bit of fun at the same time when I came up with the idea of the doom and gloom series I thought that sounded like the kind of entertainment people like but perhaps I was wrong sometimes a monk might have a distorted perspective so I'm going to be sharing some slides and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it so thank you for coming along this is the guide to how to survive the end of the world if that's possible at all and I guess I have to explain why I'm doing this. So uh, some of you will know, of course, that oh, I am here at the monastery at the end of the world, Lokanta Vihara. So Lokanta means the end of the world, and Vihara is a monastery. So I'm here with my dear teacher, Bhante Sujato. And we live here, two monks, one space, a looming apocalypse. What could possibly go wrong? So, yes, there have been concerns that this could be an apocalyptic Buddhist doomsday cult. Uh, and although I always say, no, it's not, Bhante Sujata will say, or is it? <laughs> so there's many reasons why uh, Bhante Sujata, who was, was the, the progenitor of this project, uh, called it the Monastery at the End of the World. And if you want to know about those reasons, then you can uh, look on our website and you'll see uh, an interview I, I did with, with Bhante Sujato. But probably you'll get the, the hint, if those people who know us, that we're interested in the end of the world in terms of things like climate change. And there's a few other meanings, uh, such as... Um, one that we'll explore a bit later about the jhanas and nibbana and also perhaps this place where we're living. Many people uh, think of the western suburbs of Sydney as the end of the world. So there's <laughs> a bit of a joke there. So I wonder how you think the end of the world will come about. This is something Bhante Sujato and I often talk about actually, how is it all going to end? Even today, I saw that there's been some asteroid that was coming for Earth. So you might think, 
how will the world end? I wonder how, how you'd like it to end. Would it be an alien invasion, perhaps? Would it be uh, a sudden nuclear destruction? Would it be an impact from an asteroid? Would it be uh, a disease that wipes us out? Who knows how the world will end? But I like this little joke, which is, of course, about a cataclysm. And thinking about the end of the world, what will you do if the world was about to end tomorrow? What would you do? How would you react? The world is so uncertain. We live each day thinking tomorrow will come. But for many people, tomorrow doesn't come either because they pass on themselves or because uh, in the future, perhaps, who knows, things could change so suddenly. This is one of the, the ways I try to think about the end of the world, with a happy mind and a smile on my face. So when it comes to these heavy issues of thinking about uh, sickness, old age, death, um, these can be really taboo issues. And of course, for us Buddhists, we kind of confront these issues quite frequently. And sometimes when I'm talking to more general audiences, I'm very aware that people are not accustomed to directly looking at these things. So we're in a very fortunate position as Buddhists because we have insight into the Dhamma, and, we, and the Buddha, of course, talked about these things over and over and over again, and he never tried to hide them from us through his teachings. You might remember the story of the Buddha, that uh, his father tried to hide the Buddha and tried to keep him sequestered from these things of old age, sickness and death. But if we're going to make progress on the spiritual path, we need to be alert to these things. In fact, they should inspire us to practice. And this is uh, that wonderful topic I introduced last week of Sam Vega, this spiritual urgency that propels us on the path, this urgency to practice, to get out of the mess that, uh, that we're in. Even seeing a little bit of old age, sickness and death, seeing a fraction of the truth, should inspire us by making us think, how am I living my life? And this is the great gift of the Dhamma for us, to inspire us, to make us see clearly and to help us understand the importance of things like practicing ethical conduct, making merit through things like generosity and developing our mind through meditation. And so, yes, I like to... Um, come at it with a sense of humour because that makes it the, the peel of these truths go down a little bit more easily with a touch of sweetness. So we're all going to die. And who knows when it will happen. It's easy to, to see on the news the deaths of others, and it's hard to look at something like this, a funeral pyre, and to, to think one day this will be my body. And then in the bigger picture, we think about what we're doing to other animals, other beings. When we think about the end of the world, think about how many beings around the world face extinction because of our actions. Think about how we perhaps are the ones creating the end of the world for many species. And of course, as Buddhists, we have a bigger perspective and we understand that there is this thing called impermanence. We appreciate that things change. We know from our study of science and history that there has been countless 
genocides of animals and beings, mass extinction events. And it's easy for us to become a little bit, a little bit offhand, maybe a little bit unkind, perhaps a little bit cruel when we discuss these things, thinking that we have some sort of uh, superior view, a kind of spiritual smugness that might creep in. And it's very easy to do some spiritual bypassing and say, well, you know, we're all going to die. Doesn't matter. You know, think that we've got the Buddhist view, think that we've got the upper hand. Of course, when it comes to our own life, that's when things will really start to come home to us. Or when our friends or family pass, then things are slightly different. And one of the questions I ask a lot is, you know, uh, if, if nothing matters, then nothing matters. But the Buddha didn't say nothing matters. He said things do matter, our actions do matter. So we have to be careful about going too quickly to this ultimate view. We have to remember that for every life, every creature, every human, that life is really precious. And we don't diminish that life through things like carelessness or wantonness. We don't uh, want to do any harm. We want to protect life, including all the animals that we interact with in our homes, all the animals in our environment, all the people around us, and people that we don't see in other places. All beings everywhere value their life. And so we have to be very careful that we don't become uh, unconsciously cruel and do that thing of spiritual bypassing. A good way to look at it is, you know, sure, we all get born into the world, but our parents, knowing that we're bound to die one day, still cared for us, still looked after us. We know that our teeth will get old and fall out, but we still brush our teeth. So we still care. We still take um, an interest and we look after the things that we have responsibility for. So this is an important thing to do when we're looking at a big picture. We don't want to think that we're perhaps more advanced spiritually than we are. We want to understand that uh, just because we have a bigger perspective doesn't mean we don't need to pay attention to the details. And so this is something to keep in mind as we go through this talk about the end of the world. In the same way that this little baby is still very sad that all, all the dinosaurs' friends are dead. And one of my favourite cartoons, I use this quite a lot in my teaching, is, of course, Little Dog in the House on Fire. And, of course, this is another kind of spiritual bypassing, which is saying, you know, this is fine, I'm okay, and everything will be okay. But of course, again, this is not the solution that the Buddha pointed out. We don't just accept that everything is terrible and do nothing about it. We need to uh, understand the Buddha's teachings clearly and we're not going to live in denial. We're not going to practice spiritual bypassing things like exaggerated detachment or emotional numbing. When we think about all the changes in the world, environmental catastrophe, all our personal um, traumas and dilemmas, all the suffering of the world, we don't bypass it. We need to see it clearly and we need to be okay with that. So this is just another kind of framing that I wanted to do as we go along in this talk. So... One of the suttas that I constantly come back to is this beautiful sutta by, um, spoken by the Buddha telling a story about Arika. And this is one of my favourite teachings because it's so visual, it's so powerful, the way this teacher, Arika, introduces some similes to think about impermanence. And there's a beautiful refrain in this sutta Life as a human is short, brief and fleeting, full of pain and misery. 
So Arika, the sage, he doesn't mince words at all here, giving the harsh truths. Think about this and wake up. Think about this and wake up. Do what's good. Live the spiritual life for no one who is born can escape death. So this sage Arika had students and he gave a series of beautiful similes to those students, each simile followed by this statement here that life as a human is short. And in the sutta, which is so beautiful to read in the Anguttara Sevens, uh, it kind of builds up into this crescendo of uh, powerful understanding of the nature of impermanence. And so he presents seven very easy to remember similes. The first, as we just saw then, is that dewdrop on a blade of grass. So quickly that dewdrop burns up and evaporates, disappears. And this is what it means to have a human life. It's so fleeting, disappears so quickly, just like that dewdrop. This is a classic image from Buddhism, this idea of impermanence. He says it's like a water bubble in the rain. No sooner has that bubble appeared that it bursts. And this is what it means to have a human life. So short, so fleeting. He says it's like a line drawn in the water. No sooner is it drawn that it disappears. So fleeting is this human life. Like a fast flowing river. It cannot be stopped. And this is how it is for us to live, flowing towards death. He says it's like a glob of spit in someone's mouth and spat out. This is what it's like for us, kind of spat out by life, and that's it. Like a tiny sliver of meat thrown into a pan that's been heated all day long. That tiny slither of meat sizzles and disappears. Where the meat? That's what it means to be a human, here and then gone. And like a cow led to slaughter, each step of that cow each and every step, bringing it closer and closer to death. And so this beautiful teaching by Arika. And the Buddha says that at the time of Arika, who's a sage who lived so many years ago, the human lifespan was so long, immeasurably long, thousands and thousands of years long. And even then, with such a, life, a long lifespan, Arika always taught about impermanence. And so in the context of this discussion about the end of the world, our world, personal worlds, are going to end sometime. The worlds of people around us are going to end sometime. All the humans, all the beings who have ever lived have passed away. And so this is the real end of the world. <laughs> this is something we're going to have to deal with. And another of my favourite suttas, which many people on this call will be familiar with, is the teaching of the Pabatu Pasutta, the simile of the mountain. And this is uh, found in the Samyutta Nikaya. And I just... Stop sharing for a second to introduce the story, which is the Buddha is, is uh, uh, walking and he sees the king, Persenity, coming towards him. King Persenity, of course, is a very important king, very busy, very self-important. And so he's coming looking very frazzled. And the Buddha says to him, hmm, where have you come from, king? And... King Persenity says, well, I, you know, I've been dealing with all the affairs of state. You know, he's a very busy person, very important. Got lots of things to do, yeah? 
But of course, you know, when you focus on these small things, you're not really seeing the big picture. We're all a little bit like King for sanity, aren't we? We're all intoxicated by our very important things that we do. And we're not even kings. So, so the Buddha, hoping to perhaps reframe King Pasanadi's view and to show him a deeper truth, to get him to see a larger perspective, says, what would you say, King, if I told you that there was a mountain coming from the West, a giant mountain crushing everything in its path, and a mountain from the east coming crushing everything and north and south. So it's like this giant mountainous garbage compactor coming, coming, coming towards you. And the king who has some wisdom says when he's asked by the Buddha, should such a terrible threat arise, a, ter a terrible loss of human life when human life is so rare, what would you do? The king says, well, he will practice dhammacharya. Dhammacharya is practicing the way of the dharma, practicing living by the dharma, understanding the teachings, living in accordance with the dharma, trying to see clearly the nature of reality. And he will practice sammacharya. This is living in harmony living a moral life, living with an evenness of mind. And he says he'll practice kusala kiriya, doing good actions, these are the 10 wholesome actions, things like not killing, not stealing, uh, things like being non-covetousness and not having any ill will and practicing right view. And he says he will practice punya kiriya, doing meritorious actions. So these things are, are things like uh, uh, generosity, uh, service, reciting the Dharma, practicing your meditation. These are all punya kiriya. These are things that are good to do, that give good results, collect a storehouse of merit. And so this is what the Buddha uh, wanted us to do. The king replied, like a textbook perfect response to the Buddha. These are the things that we should do when faced with old age, sickness, and death. And these were the things that the Buddha said that those mountains represent. Old age, sickness, death, coming to crush you. Inescapable old age, sickness, and death. So what would you do? the Buddha asks, when faced with these things. And of course, we are faced with these mountains of old age, sickness and death every day. So faced with a kind of apocalypse, faced with the end of the world, the question still is, how will you live your life? And this is something that I often think about when, I, when Bhante Sujato and I are talking doom and gloom, the climate catastrophe, the future apocalypse of a world that's been ruined by humans and we're all uh, you're scattered about, water shortages, um, food shortages, natural disasters. This kind of world might seem imaginative and dystopian and unreal, but if you were in such a world, how would you live? If you were in such a world, would you still maintain your precepts? Would you still be kind? Would you share your food? Would you not kill? And the same thing goes for us every single day of our life. It's easy when conditions are good to practice the Dharma. It's difficult when we're faced with uh, exterior circumstances that are challenging. And even those things of old age, sickness and death, 
these are going to challenge us. These are going to test our practice of the Dhamma, our understanding of the Dhamma. So easy to read a sutta, so easy to hear teaching and to think, ah, yes, 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 death will come. But then when death happens, a loved one passes, a beloved pet, we forget so quickly. And so how do we practice the Dhamma? This is going to be really important for us every day in our life to practice the Dhamma in the way that the Buddha instructed. Of course, the problem with these beautiful kinds of minds, Dhammacharya, Samacharya, Kusakirya, Punyakirya, all of these beautiful states of mind, the Buddha said will lead to a heavenly rebirth. But a heavenly rebirth is not extinguishment. It's not the end. A heavenly rebirth means that we will still be reborn. We have not gone beyond old age, sickness and death. We've not gone beyond separation or karma. We will still be reborn. And so that cycle of samsara will continue. And so this image which I shared with you last week of the earth, and I talked about the importance of a bigger perspective of seeing things more clearly and how so often we have like a small object right in front of us like that King Persenity did, you know, all this stuff going on in his life right up in his face, you know, you can't see beyond it. And how important developing a larger perspective, a bigger view is so that we can see clearly. And of course, this is what the Buddha provided us with when he talked about the true nature of suffering. So it's, as the Kivisa monks on the call here uh, from Bodhinyana Monastery, you know, remembering Venerable Upasama, who once when I was brooming, sweeping with him, told me when I, when I said to him, oh, I know how to sweep, Venerable, he's like, you don't even know what you don't know about sweeping. And in the same way, the Buddha, when he talked about suffering, you know, we think we know what suffering means, but actually we have no idea of the true scale of our suffering. And this ignorance is what the Buddha managed to overcome. And the way he overcame it was through what's known as the three enlightenment knowledges or the tevijas. These are the three knowledges that he gained um, on the night of his enlightenment, which showed the true scale of suffering in samsara. So the first one is the knowledge of past lives. This aligns with the first noble truth of suffering. And he said that he could see back countless lives to no discernible beginning. And he could see how he lived, the food he ate, where he was reborn, culture, the life he lived. He could see this endless chain going back, back, back to no discernible beginning, just back and back and back of rebirth. And this is the scale, the perspective the Buddha wants us to appreciate when he talks about suffering, wants us to understand the true peril of old age, sickness and death, so that we can start to think about an escape. Second tevija is seeing the results of actions, seeing karma, the workings of karma, this aligns to the second noble cause, the, 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 sorry, the, the cause of our experience, seeing that our actions matter. And this is the importance of understanding and reflecting upon the law of karma. And the third knowledge is of the vision and knowledge of release. This is so important for us to understand that there is the potential and possibility of release, of freedom from suffering, and there is a way out. That, of course, is the Eightfold Noble Path. And so I just quickly show 
this uh, so these these tevijas are, are found in this sutra in the Majjhima Nikaya number four, where the Buddha talks about fear and terror, and he's talking about fear and terror of going into a forest, wilderness lodges, and being surrounded by strange noises and uh, wild creatures, and how he overcame that fear and how important it was to overcome that fear and terror. And in this uh, this sutta, he talks about these tevijas, and here we can see a small quote. I recollected many kinds of past lives. One, two, three, a thousand, a hundred thousand. So many eons of the world contracting, the world evolving, many eons of the world contracting and evolving. And this, of course, should bring up some fear, <laughs> should bring up some terror in us, this kind of scale of suffering. This is the true equanimity, not the kind of fake equanimity that we might try to generate when we look at the news or we think about our own demise, but the real equanimity, the real steadiness of mind uh, that was developed through samadhi that enabled him to see this truth this scary, frightening, terrible truth without fear, with a steady mind that was able to handle that kind of truth. And, you know, when we try to approach it by imagining or by contemplating this truth, I don't think we can get anywhere near the kind of the power of the Buddha's vision. That's why we're so fortunate that he was able to share such vision with us. But we can, we can approach it in various other ways, this idea of scale, this idea of a bigger picture, this idea of the impermanence of our life here as a human, the impermanence of our culture, the impermanence of nature here on earth, the impermanence of perhaps even our world. And because I've been talking for a little while and it's all been pretty heavy, thought I'd share with you a video um, and it's got some pretty rousing music. So either enjoy or turn the sound off up to you. And it's about the observable universe. So I don't know about you, but it certainly puts things into perspective for me. And instead of feeling any anxiety or fear, or um, uh, depression, <laughs> when I see the scale of this cosmos and I realise how insignificant I am, how small I am, I get a sense of peace that comes over me. And this is something that I often find when I teach things like uh, contemplations on death, that it's possible for us by seeing in line with the truth, seeing in line with the Dhamma, that we get this uh, pasadi, this beautiful sense of peace and stillness that comes. It's kind of very soft, yielding embrace of reality where you don't feel scared, you don't feel overwhelmed, but you just accept. And so I think this is a very important place for us to get to with these big picture issues. It can help us uh, to have a mind which is accepting of the nature of our lives, old age, sickness and death, of environmental tragedy, all those sorts of things, it allows us to have a mind which is balanced rather than overbalancing into something like an obsession with health, with wealth, with, uh, with you know, trying to hold back the forces of, of the earth and also stops us from overbalancing into depression and sadness. And so this kind of expansiveness that we can absorb through looking at a video like that, we can get an analogy perhaps to that powerful mind of the Buddha when he was uh, in those stages of enlightenment, seeing, you know, the true scope 
Can you imagine? I don't think we make enough of this vision of the Buddha seeing this incredible, powerful, vast suffering that we've had and understanding the compassion he had to teach us about it. It's really beautiful. And so I'll keep on going with some doom and gloom. I, I realize I'm already going to be running out of time. So I might skip a few bits, um, such as this fascinating sutra, if you ever get a chance to look at the Aganya Sutta, which talks about the expansion and contraction of the universe and uh, is a kind of creation myth uh, that might have been told time of the Buddha, all sorts of stuff going in, in that and in a bad scholarly fashion, I just took out those ideas about expansion and contraction, which the Buddha talks about, to talk about how, how these huge cycles, these cycles of the cosmos are playing out and have played out for billions and billions of years. And similarly, this idea of even something that we take for granted as being constant and permanent, our sun, seeing that one day this sun in billions and billions of years' time, just like all stars, will get hotter and hotter and become a red giant and then explode in a supernova. And this was something that the Buddha also kind of alluded to or maybe, uh, maybe we're reading too much into it perhaps in the Sutta of the Seven Suns where suns appear in the sky one after the next and Buddha says there comes a time when a second sun appears in the sky. This is a wonderful sutra. If you would like to read it, it's in the Ankutra Nikaya 7s. So what happens is after the second sun appears, things get a little bit hotter. So as you, as you know, even having one sun, you know, can still have droughts and cause a lot of problems and water is scarce and is unreliable and uncertain. So the Buddha says a second sun appears in the sky and then things get hotter. And then a third sun appears in the sky and a fourth sun. And all the time things are getting hotter and hotter and that water is starting to evaporate. Eventually the water in the oceans becomes less and less and less so that it's only a few palm trees in height. And then it gets less and less and less. So it's only the size of a human and then less and less and less water in that ocean as the suns appear and heat up the earth until there's not enough water to even dip your toe in. And it doesn't end there. It's, it's quite an apocalyptic story. It doesn't end there. Things get worse. Another sun appears in the sky and all the mountains start to burn up. And eventually a uh, seventh sun appears in the sky and those burning mountains, like the Mount Sinaru, the biggest mountain that exists, explodes and there's nothing left. And this is this incredible apocalyptic scenario that the Buddha alludes to. You know, is it real? Is he telling us a story about the future? Or is he describing the life cycle of a sun? Or is he talking about the end of the world? Or is it a teaching that's designed to make us think about the impermanent nature of reality and to get us to contemplate impermanence? And again, in this sutta, there's a beautiful refrain that comes each and every time the sun appears in the sky. He says, mendicants, conditions, are impermanent, conditions are unstable, conditions are unreliable. And this is quite enough for you to become disillusioned, dispassionate and freed regarding all conditions. So here the Buddha alluding to that larger cycle of samsara, pointing out the instability of conditions, that this world, this sun that we take for granted will change. We can't rely upon these things. 
And what is the solution? The solution isn't trying to hide from the suns, isn't trying to blow up the suns or uh, create a dome which will survive us. No, the solution is becoming disillusioned, dispassionate, and freed. This is nibbida, viraga, vimuti. We want to get out of this terrible cycle of suffering. And he tells a story at the end of the sutta about a sage, uh, another ascetic called Sunata. And I'll just quickly go through this because I think it's important in, in, in terms of what the Buddha is asking us to, to do on the Buddhist path. He says, this sage who practiced, you know, contemplating impermanence and practiced love, he was not exempt from rebirth, old age, and death. He was not exempt from sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and despair. Why? Because he didn't understand and did not penetrate four things. Noble ethics, that's sila. Immersion, that's samadhi. Wisdom, that's panya. And freedom, vimuti. These noble ethics immersion, wisdom, and freedom, and have been comprehended and understood by the Buddha, craving for continued existence has been cut off. The attachment to continued existence is ended, and now there'll be no more future births. And so you might remember, as I said before, that when we're talking about King Persenity in the mountain, talking about those beautiful qualities of Dhammacharya, Sammacharya, uh, Kusalakirya, Punyakirya, but they only led to the stage of a heavenly rebirth, but they weren't an ultimate solution. So for us, as we practice the Buddhist path, of course, we should practice these things. We should develop beautiful mind states of giving, of uh, generosity, of, of being liberal with our uh, wealth and our belongings. We should practice these beautiful mind states of ethical conduct. We should, of course, develop the meditation aspect of the path. The meditation aspect is what's going to take us further and deeper into penetrating with wisdom the truth. And seeing the truth is what helps us uh, to see what the Buddha saw. So there's an opportunity there for us. This is why we have to do things like keep on inclining the mind towards seeing the truth in our daily lives, looking at old age, sickness, and death. And then in our practice of meditation, seeing impermanence, understanding the nature of cause and effect, developing the mind through samadhi so that it can see sharply and clearly into the true nature of reality. And when we see that, understand it and be able to handle it. And so the Buddha is always talking like this with the monks. He's always asking them to reflect upon the true nature of our existence and getting us to see the bigger perspective. And there's a whole series of suttas that if you're interested in um, things like doom and gloom and the really big picture of samsara, you should check out the Anamatika Samyutta, number 15 in the Samyutta Nikaya, whole heap of discourses about that same thing of the problem of our role of nature of samsara. And again, this phrase, this is quite enough for you to become dispassionate. So he asked questions like in this sutra about tears saying, what is more, the flow of tears you've shed whilst roaming and transmigrating? That's roaming and transmigrating in samsara for such a very long time, weeping and wailing, from being united with the unloved and separated from the loved, which is larger, those tears or the water in the four oceans. So here again, this idea of perspective, developing a larger perspective, developing the correct view, seeing the nature of our suffering. And oh, oh, we're all gone the wrong way. And the answer is, of course, it's those tears that we've shed that is larger 
than the water of the four oceans. And this is such a powerful image to contemplate. How much suffering we've had over countless lives, so much suffering, more than enough to become disillusioned, disenchanted, more than enough to seek freedom. And I'll just fast forward a little bit because I ran out of time. And again, a single person, the Buddha says that one person alone roaming and transmigrating for an eon would amass a heap of bones the size of a huge mountain called Mount Vepula if they were gathered and not lost. Why is that? Transmigration has no known beginning, enough for you to become disillusioned, dispassionate and freed regarding all conditions. So here's a, a picture of um, maybe something that we can use to get that image in our head of those bones piled up, our bones, bones that belong to us, piled up high as a mountain. These are bison bones from killing bisons in uh, 19th century America. And, you know, this is just one species of bones. So the Buddha is saying that our bones would be a huge mountain. And so this is how the Buddha instructed his disciples to see. And the bison apparently were almost made extinct, actually. And, uh, you know, th there's the end of the world for those bison. But fortunately, because of human intervention, they were saved and now they're flourishing again. So, of course, the Buddha here is getting us to think for ourselves and inviting us to do the work, to do the spiritual work of investigating, of seeing more clearly the nature of our reality. And of course, when we look closely, we see that perhaps we've played some role in wandering about in samsara. We've had this craving and ignorance which causes us to take life after life after life. And this is, of course, the uh, dependent origination. This is how we go from one life to the next because of ignorance mixed with craving. And so it's important for us to take responsibility for our spiritual trajectory. Buddha isn't asking us to run and hide. He's not saying live in denial. He's not saying do nothing. He's inviting us to uh, get that bigger perspective, develop that samvega, that spiritual urgency to propel us further on the spiritual path. He lays out the spiritual path for us in its completion, in its entirety, and says that this path is guaranteed to lead to the result which we want to get. And this result, of course, is not an alleviation of suffering. It's not a, uh, a, a, a band-aid. It's a complete cessation of suffering. And this, I just, I think I have to move on here. Um, and this, of course, is Nibbana. So this is extinguishment. This is how the Buddha described Nibbana, like a lamp going out. And in the Ratana Sutta, we have these words, the old is ended, nothing new is produced. Their minds have no desire for future rebirth. Withered are the seeds. Kina Bija, there's no desire for growth. Those wise ones are extinguished just like this lamp. And it's this remainderless fading away that the Buddha is talking about when he talks about the end of the world. And in the Rohitasa Sutta, the Sutta that I just fast forwarded through, we have uh, the Buddha talking about how uh, this very body is the tool that we use. We can't 
get to the end of the world. We can't get to the end of old age, sickness and death by walking all the way to the end of the world. We can't get to the end of the world by going to the edge of the observable universe. We need to use this very body to investigate the Noble Eightfold Path. We need to use this very body to get to the end of the world, which is how we conceive and how we know this body. This very body is the tool that we can use to get to Nibbana. And so this is how you survive the end of the world, not by surviving at all, in fact, but by extinguishment, by release and freedom, by attaining Nibbana. So this is the path that the Buddha outlined, and this is the way that we need to go if we want to survive the end of the world too. And this is a short talk about doom and gloom, the end of the world, and I hope it will be of some benefit to you all.